Uh, today I have a queen bumblebee, Bombus vosnesenskii. Um, this is kind of sad. It was an overwintering queen here in Seattle, Washington. And uh, the queens overwinter, and in the spring they come out of hibernation, and they've got to find some nectar and some pollen. Uh, and if they don't, they'll, they won't make it, and that's what happened to this one. Uh, we had a very wet and still having a very wet, cool spring, and uh, there just wasn't anything available for her, so I just found her dead. Um, but as getting a specimen, that's a good way to find one. I'd rather not kill one if I don't have to. So I'm going to make a specimen out of this. Uh, it was April 9th is when I found her. Uh, we have uh, several different bumblebees here in Washington State, in western Washington. Uh, one in particular Bombus oxentalis used to be quite common here, and even back in the 90s, and more, more recently has uh, disappeared. So there's some concern, certainly, of what's happening to it. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But for now, I'm going to make a specimen out of this. Um, bumblebees are very furry. Uh, if you get them wet, the fur will mat and it's very difficult to get them looking good again. This one looks really good. I think the yellow is a little bit faded just because she's been all winter like this. Um, so I'm going to get about a uh, number three pin and then put it right through the center of the thorax. Good. Very nice and straight. You can look below and see where the pin came through. Yep, right in the middle. Uh, bumblebee is very cute. I, I like them a lot. Uh, I've The only time they can become aggressive is if you're close to their nest. And they typically nest in the ground, in an old rodent burrow, or uh, underneath you know, wood pile or shrub that's growing close to the ground, nice protected area. They uh, never have very many individuals in a particular nest. What happens is the queen um, lays eggs in the spring and produces some other female workers and to help her out and uh, she'll raise, um, you know, get some uh, pollen and nectar accumulated and raise a couple batches of larvae and then at some point when the colony gets big enough then she'll produce queens and drones males and then those will uh, go off and mate and the drones will die and the females will hibernate over the winter and then start a new nest and the founding individuals all die and the, uh, the rest of them die. Uh, now. So this is going to be pretty simple to do. Uh, the wings, look how small they are. It's amazing they can fly. Um, I usually like to position these wings a little bit with some pins. As you can see, they're sort of haphazardly arranged. So, I might, well, first thing I'll do is I'll raise the abdomen up just a little bit. Just to make it look a little more natural there. And then uh, I'll push this forewing back a little bit so you can see the abdomen. These uh, bumblebees can be identified primarily by the color patterns on their head and thorax and abdomen, and also by their size, um, length of tongue how furry they are. Um, the pattern isn't alone isn't necessarily in all species the best way or a definitive way to identify them because some of them have a, a couple of different patterns of yellow stripes within even within the same species. So let's try and make that look. Yeah, that's good so we can see the abdomen it helps with identification. And then we'll just lift the antennas up a little bit. See those?
There, that's very simple. Move this leg back a little bit. Yeah, I've never seen them be aggressive <coughs> without gathering pollen and nectar, and they're just completely indifferent to a person. They're not going to bother you at all. So. And they're fuzzy and cute. They look like little flying Muppets. All right, we'll let that dry. All right, we can make a label for this one. Uh, I don't need to write USA because uh, most of this collection is USA. Washington, King County, Seattle, uh, 9th of April. We write the number, write the month in abbreviation, and then 2017, and uh, Bombus. Voss. S. And then my name, Don Elon Collector. Okay. So when that specimen is dry, I can put this label on it. Uh, this is the Hymenoptera box of my teaching collection. And in this corner here are all of bees. And I have quite a few bumblebees here too. Um, this is the Occidentalis that I mentioned that became scarce here. Uh, they found a couple of them here and there around the northwest, Washington and Oregon and it's become part of a concerted effort to study them and understand uh, what's happening with them and so we can have some kind of conservation strategy. Uh, this one was collected in Lane County, Oregon in 1995. Uh, there's an organization called the Xerxes Society which is in uh, invertebrate conservation group and they're working on the bumblebee uh, issue here in the Northwest. Um, a couple of years ago I met up with uh, a fellow named Rich Hatfield. He came up and did a lecture here in Seattle talking about the bumblebees and I asked him if he would be interested in historical data for my collection and he was enthusiastic about that. So uh, 2013 I brought down all of my bumblebees from the United States and it's 68 specimens collected over the last uh, 36 years and he identified all of them in one weekend and uh, the whole identification that he did, he's an expert at it and it was very interesting uh, got stuff from all over the country here Oregon, British Columbia, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico um, Connecticut, New York, Minnesota, Wyoming, um, Wisconsin, Washington. Uh, so that was a contribution to this database. And what this does is this allows the researchers to know where these species are and uh, so they can go back and presumably find the same population um, it's essential to uh, develop a conservation strategy. So sometimes people ask, you know, what, what good are these collections? Why are you collecting these? Well, we don't know. In, in the future, th there's some purpose. This database serves a purpose, and this was a good example of that. Um, so all of, all, of the bu all of the bumblebees that I've collected so far have become part of this database, and the ones I collect in the future will also be part of that database. So these are bumblebees. These are called digger bees. They look very similar to bumblebees, but they're not. Um, these are uh, carpenter bees. They're solitary bees. Uh, these are helictid bees. They're also called sweat bees. They're kind of pretty. Most of them are green. Um, megachillid bees, also solitary bees. Uh, orchard mason bees, which are being grown now as pollinators. Very popular. Um, and honeybees. I have a queen here, 
uh, worker drone. Um, this is, would be an Africanized bee. All of the honeybees south of, you know, in Arizona and south are all Africanized bees, which are m no more dangerous than any regular hum uh, honeybee, just that they're very aggressive, so the hive will come out and sting you to death. And then other hymenopterans here I have uh, tarantula wasps. These are the ones at uh, Pompilidae. These hunt tarantulas solitary. They lay their eggs on tarantulas. Uh, there's some scolids here. These are giant scolids from Asia. Um, these are uh, horntails, primitive wasps. The larvae feed in wood. Palacinid wasps, um, parasitic wasps, braconids and ichneumonids. Um, hornets. Here's the Japanese giant hornet. Uh, sand wasps. Uh, cicada hunters. Um, uh, paper wasps. Polybdine paper wasps. Uh, yellow jackets and stuff over here. Um, these are cricket hunters. A beautiful steel blue cricket hunter. Those are very rare and difficult to get. And then there's ants, which are also part of Hymenoptera. These are uh, the giant ants, bullet ants, uh, and um, Asian giant ants. This is the Tanzanian um, ant, uh, uh, the equivalent of um, um, the army ants. Uh, and then yeah, I got some army ants here too, here with big jaws. Yeah. So, very interesting group.